Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Valuing Nature Natural Capital webinar. We'll just wait one more minute just to let people join us. I can see there's still people joining us at a rate. So hopefully you can all see a screen with our slides on and we'll, we'll run through those slides in a moment. Okay, I can see we've hit 60 attendees, so let's begin. Welcome again, everybody, to the Valuing Nature Natural Capital webinar. This is the second in our webinar series, and we're delighted today to be able to introduce Claire Lawson and Emma Rothero with their report on the natural capital of wetlands. The way we're going to run this today is that I'm, sorry, I should introduce myself, I'm Anita Weatherby, I'm based at the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology, and I'll give a brief introduction to the Valuing Nature programme before I hand over to Claire and Emma, who will talk you through their report. We'll then have about 15 minutes for people to ask and answer questions. And my colleague here, Victoria Barlow, will read out those questions. So as we go along, please feel free to type your questions in and then we can, we can ask Claire and Emma to respond. So the Valuing Nature programme, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar already. This is a five year, seven million pound programme funded across four different research councils and DEFRA. We have the lead funder of the Natural Environment Research Council, but we also have funding from the Biological and Bioscience, Economic and Social and Arts and Humanities Research Council. And the reason for that is that the idea of addressing the questions about how we value the natural environment really cut across those different research council interests and we recognised there was a need to try and build interdisciplinary working across those areas to try and address these questions. So the aim of the programme is up on the slide there, it's to better understand and represent the complexities of the natural environment in valuation analysis, considering the wider social, cultural values of ecosystem services. So it's really thinking about how do we make decisions about the natural environment and how does our research understanding help us make better decisions. The Valuing Nature programme has three main goals, the first of which is to build this community that's capable of working across these different discipline boundaries. We call that the Valuing Nature Network. It's both working across the discipline boundaries and also working much more closely with practitioners in businesses and policy and other areas of practice. So bringing together those researchers with those practitioners. And with that end in mind, the funders um, supported a programme coordination team which is where myself and Victoria come in, and our job is to try and build this Valuing Nature Network. We've done that through running a whole series of activities. We have an annual conference, we have placement schemes where individuals can go and work in a different discipline or a different applied context. We've run a series of business engagement activities, and we've had a set of publications that have come out, um, for example, our Demystifying Economics publication. As well as the Valuing Nature Network, there are two sets of research projects under the Valuing Nature programme. The first set look at human health and well-being. What's the role of the natural environment in promoting human health and well-being? And there are four research projects in that area. The second topic looks at ecosystem stocks and tipping points. So it's about understanding the relationships between the flows of ecosystem services and the benefits to humans from those services and avoiding abrupt and damaging change in the delivery of those benefits that we've referred to as tipping points. So those seven projects are now coming towards an end and part of our role as the coordination team is to promote the outputs of those projects and to, to kind of synthesise the lessons from the whole programme. And that's what we'll be doing in the next year. If you haven't already signed up, please do join the Valuing Nature Network. We have about 2,000 members net now and about 4,000 followers on Twitter um, and a series of events and activities that we publicise through a newsletter. So if you sign up to the network, you'll get that newsletter and hear what's going on in the next year. So one of the big topics under Valuing Nature is the whole concept of natural capital. And we were looking at this as the Valuing Nature program a couple of years ago, and we realised that although everybody's talking about natural capital and it's very high on the policymakers' agendas, there's a, a bit of a, a disconnect between what we actually understand as researchers and how we feed that into practice in terms of natural capital. So we're able to find some funding to commission a set of reports in this area. 
um, particularly summarising the current state of knowledge for users um, in businesses, in policy, in practice and research. Those five reports are now published and available on the website, and these webinars are for the uh, authors of those reports to take them to a wider audience. So this is the full webinar series. We're delighted today to be on, on the second one. We have Claire Lawson and Emma Rothero talking about the report on the natural capital of floodlands, uh, floodplains. Tomorrow we have Richard Payne, who will talk about trade-offs in natural capital with afforested peatlands. So that's um, where peatlands that have been planted have come to the end of their, their, their life. What, what decisions should we take about what we do next with them? Is it best to plant them as, as uh, forests again, or should they be uh, made back into peatland, or should there be other management approaches taken? On the 13th of February, we'll hear from Jess Davis and Victoria James Bassett about their soil natural capital valuation, and they've particularly worked with agri-food businesses looking at their experience of valuation in that area. And then finally, on the 19th of February, we'll have Rose Pritchard telling us about her report on monetary natural capital assessment in the private sector, looking at case studies of what's worked in that area. So with no further ado, I'll hand over to Claire and Emma, but just a reminder that we will have 15 minutes for questions, so please do type in your questions as you go along. It, it'll be helpful for us if you can use quite simple language and spell out the acronyms there so we make sure we really understand the questions well. Okay, I'll hand over to Claire now. Claire, are you there? I am here and I'm just trying to get my, hopefully my slides uh, coming up shortly. So thank you very much, Anita, for that introduction to the Natural Capital Programme and welcome uh, to you all for this webinar on uh, floodplains. Um, as Anita says, my name's Claire Lawson and I'm a lecturer in the School of Environment, Earth and Ecosystem Sciences at the Open University. And with me this afternoon is my colleague, Emma Rothero. Hi, yes, uh, my name is Emma Rothero and I'm the Floodplain Meadows Partnership Project Manager and uh, Claire and I worked on this together. Okay, so thank you, Emma. Uh, yes, yeah, so our talk this afternoon will really discuss the benefits delivered by floodplains, and it's going to use uh, species-rich flood meadows as a case study. Now, floodplains are a complex environment, and that's what we really want to get across to you. So they comprise of both terrestrial and freshwater components. And it's this complexity, uh, the relationship between the hydrology, the physical, the biogeochemical, and ecological processes that provide many ecosystem goods and services, but we would say are obtainable from floodplains, but aren't obtainable from other landscapes. So uh, floodplain meadows, um, I think you'll agree by looking at the slide, are a beautiful and ancient habitat. And they have evolved over many hundreds of years through the development of farming. And the, it's the traditional management of hay cutting and the aftermath grazing that has resulted in this distinctive character of floodplain meadows that we see today. And this is uh, one of the floodplain meadows uh, on the River Thames upstream of Oxford, known as Yarnton Mead. And here is, another, is a, a second one, uh, which is Cricklade National Nature Reserve. So this, again, is further up the River Thames, uh, right at the top of uh, the Thames catchment. Um, and this uh, site, um, I think you would agree that it is, uh, they're vibrant and they're colourful, um, but they're highly valued for their wildlife landscape, but also their history. But these floodplain meadows remain one of the rarest grassland types in the UK. And it is thought that less than um, 3,000 hectares remain. And I think one of the problems is that over the past 80 years or so, there's been this wide tread, uh, widespread transformation, really, of floodplains from a naturally functioning landscape to a highly modified one. So the improved land drainage and flood management schemes have allowed the use of these floodplains 
instead of being the traditional uh, use of hay cutting and grazing or maybe wetter uh, vegetation types, they've allowed this uh, land use to change substantially and floodplains are now more often than not used by intensive agriculture and urban development. So although food production and intensive agriculture, there's probably been a, a switch really in um, we now recognise that it is no longer regarded as the primary use of floodplains. And we do depend on them as a society for many environmental goods and services. So we see them as multifunctional rather than as just one prime uh, pro food production use. Um, so they have obviously have a, a widely recognised value in, in regulating flood events. They su supply that essential space outside the river channel for flood water to spread out. But we, they also provide many other different uh, benefits. And what we were particularly interested in doing is whether the benefits delivered by the species rich habitats, such as floodplain meadows, wet woodlands and fens, are greater and more diverse than those from other land use types within the floodplain, especially that of in intensely cultivated land. And to do this, we use the natural capital approach to try and emphasize that floodplain habitats have this multifunctionality. Now, I'm hoping that this slide is familiar to many of you, but just in case it isn't, this is from um, the post note. And so we have the stock of natural capital on the left side. And that's the, the assets, that's the elements of nature that produce the ecosystem services. So we get a flow from the left to the right. And then that provides the value or the benefits to society. And in the UK, natural capital accounts have been um, developed for semi-natural grasslands, although the Office for Natural Statistics have only produced a draft. And they were hoping to develop some for floodplains, but they've also, uh, they're currently on hold. But I think for floodplains, there's going to be some crossover between uh, the different accounts because within floodplains, you've got so many different land uses. But one of the things that we really had to get a handle on was what the extent of each area of habitat was within the floodplain, the condition of that, uh, of, of that habitat, and then the ecosystem services that come from these, uh, these habitats and what uh, benefits they can provide to society. So one of the first things we had to do as part of our study was to look at the extent of different land uses within the floodplain. And as you can see here, um, we've got the, the land use. Um, so the main um, uh, broad um, habitat types and um, we've got the extent in England and Wales. Um, so we can see that floodplains comprise of a mixture of different land uses from both natural and semi-natural habitats. And this includes intensive agricultural land and urban areas. And in England and Wales, nearly 70% of uh, floodplains um, are covered by intensive agriculture. So that's arable and horticulture and improved grassland. Um, whereas about nine and a half for urban and just 11% for these species rich habitats. So the, the, the area of species rich habitats within floodplains has decreased markedly. So the main difference here between England and uh, the Welsh floodplain is the balance really between arable and horticulture and improved grassland. And in Wales, there's much less arable and horticulture, whereas um, the proportion of improved grassland is much higher. So this is based on the area of the different land use types within flood zone two. OK, as I said before, floodplains are complex with both terrestrial and freshwater components. And it's really this complexity that I wanted to get across to you. And if we look at this natural capital and benefits framework, where we look at the natural assets on the left, so we look at the species, the communities, the source of fresh water, and then move through the major land use categories. Floodplains kind of cross over these uh, different categories. So you'll find um, uh, agricultural land, you'll find grassland, you'll find uh, uh, other habitat woodland and other habitat types. So it's this complexity as you move from the left to the right in terms of the ecosystem services and the goods that we get from floodplains um, that are really uh, quite complex.
So here um, it's quite a busy slide, but hopefully it will get across to you the, the different uh, floodplain uh, goods and services. So the flow from the natural capital. So down on the left hand side, we have the different ecosystem services and then across the top, the land use. And it, the table represents 12 ecosystem services. These were um, selected in our review because um, they were identified as providing key goods or services by these different land uses. And also some of them where they have a negative or detrimental impact. So like arable and horticulture on carbon sequestration. So climate regulation and, and water quality, um, those were included. So many of these floodplain ecosystem goods and services um, are determined by hydrology and its effect that it has on the physical, biochemical and ecological processes. Um, so one crucial issue for the management of floodplains really is to understand the roles that these different land uses have. So arable, horticulture, improved grassland, neutral grasslands, woodland, etc what role they have in providing environmental goods and services. As you can see that each land use will provide a different set of these goods and services. And each of these will also have different quantities and different qualities. And also it may not be possible to realize all of these potential ecosystem services under one management scenario. So in some uh, managements, you might have to have a trade off uh, between the different, different uh, ecosystem services. So what we really need to understand, have a very clear understanding of these relationships supported by evidence. And this is very crucial to any decision making on land use choices or management within floodplains. And again, here we have a schematic diagram showing how the natural capital assets of floodplains um, are translated into benefits. So the pie chart uh, reflects the extent of the different land use types across England and Wales. So the area of improved grassland and arable horticulture are similar to each other. And then the area of the semi-natural habitats at the bottom um, uh, uh, is much less in terms of the area and urban. And as we can see here, the diagram highlights the different sets of services provided by these different land uses. And so while um, food production is pre predominantly through arable and horticulture and improved grassland. It is also provided by semi -natural, these semi-natural grasslands, these species fish floodplain meadows, as they are part of, of, of the farming system. So these semi-natural habitats have a vital role to play in, in conservation um, and also of our natural and social heritage, but they can also provide a, a much wider range of benefits um, in the floodplain. So they can provide sediment trapping, uh, water storage, carbon. Um, and we believe that you can provide um, much more uh, benefits to society in these semi-natural habitats than, than the more intensive land use types, particularly arable and horticultural, horticultural land. Okay, so the valuation of floodplain ecosystem services. Um, placing a monetary value on ecosystem goods and services in the floodplain is a very, very difficult thing to do. There aren't that many uh, studies that have tried to put uh, a monetary value or, on, on goods and services. And then there's also that um, intrinsic difficulty of ascribing values to benefits that aren't traded. So you, you can trade the hay or you can trade the, the beef cattle that come off these uh, species rich floodplain meadows, but trying to work out actually uh, what is the value of them in terms of um, you know, flood alleviation, it, it's quite a difficult, difficult thing to do. And there are, um, various different ways of replacement costs, so damage to, um, you know, uh, damage to property or in, in flooding, how much would it cost to replace them? So this is quite a difficult thing to do. Um, and and there, there isn't that much research out there really that uh, shows us um, whether we can uh, or should or uh, put a monetary value on that. And I would say is that really this valuation is really 
um, being used as evidence that these areas of, of semi-natural habitat can provide these benefits uh, rather than the exact uh, maybe monetary value. So here's um, an example from um, uh, Bark, uh, one of the wildlife trusts. So the Berkshire, uh, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire Wildlife Trust, they have a reserve at Chimney Meadows. Uh, again, it's on the River Thames, where they um, have done a study on the uh, monetarized that they've, they've, they've put some figures on this. So they have looked at um, the case on the left, which they call business as usual, where they have um, in terms of they have about 80 hectares of uh, arable but also areas of woodland um, and grassland and they have uh, had this vision to change the land use from this arable to species rich meadows so this is the restoration of 80 uh, hectares of arable land converting it into species rich floodplain meadow and wet pasture so the situation on the left is business as usual and the situation on the right is um, they're kind of aspirational and these are they've costed the benefits over 30, 35, uh, 30 years and um, the difference in how um, in terms of production we can see has declined so the, the yellow graph but in terms of climate regulation and natural flood management these areas have uh, increased so values per hectare um, have increased from about 155 uh, 1,000 to 414 uh, per hectare and this is by increasing the extent of the floodplain habitats um, with, within uh, this uh, nature reserve. Now another thing that we have um, tried to do um, is for one of the sites that we work on, Cricklade, so um, the I think the third uh, slide I showed had a picture of cricklades with uh, the church in the background and this is one of the study sites that um, the Floppe Meadow Partnership has um, uh, studied over 20 years really and it's just trying to work out um, we can work out the 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 money we get from the hay yield or the the, the agricultural value but it's just trying to put some numbers on um, whether you know the amount of carbon in the soil if we if you were allowed to trade this in terms of ga uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, how much it's worth uh, per, per year and uh, for water quality in terms of the sediment trapping and um, and you know using kind of broads authority uh, management sediment management strategy so these figures a kind of price per hectare and then we've kind of done a uh, uh, for the for the quick latest 44.4 hectares so um, so trying to put a price on on um, the natural hazard regulation so the flood management and stuff and overall it, it comes to just under a hundred thousand uh, pounds but that's over uh, that's two thousand two hundred twenty five pounds per hectare so it's just giving the evidence really that these they have an intrinsic value, but if you are um, going to put a monetary value on 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 these habitats within floodplains, then um, there are lots of evidence gaps. There are things that we don't understand, but it's just it's the way government are going in terms of uh, the direction of travel. So trying to to get across to them that that, that these habitats have have value um, wh whether it's the monetary value or an intrinsic value okay so here really is um, going on for that some of the evidence gaps that um, was the effectiveness for natural flood management um, we really don't have uh, much information uh, about this because uh, our report was really limited to the land use within the floodplain rather than the catchment per se so um, we don't have much uh, uh, information on this and also the complexity of the relationship as I've, as I've gone on you know it's this complexity between the terrestrial and the, and the hydrological so biogeochemical ecological um, it, it makes it a very challenging habitat to measure 
but a better understanding of these processes at habitat and community levels to provide quantitative figures to demonstrate the benefits really are important. And then also, um, not all habitats are mapped to the same level of detail. So wet woodlands compared with broadleaf woodland as a whole, we really don't know the area of, of wet woodland within, uh, within these floodplains. So there are, there's quite a lot of evidence gaps. So coming on to the key messages, I think I'd like to get across that floodplains are a very special environment. Um, so it's it's the variety and the extent of these ecosystem services that they offer. Um, and also, it's just really saying that a natural capital perspective can be used to inform and compare land use decisions. So it can be used as, as evidence for making these uh, land use choices. But given the area of improved grassland, um, within floodplains, uh, we'd say that there's an enormous potential to increase the extent of these species-rich floodplain habitats. They can still be used as an agricultural system because that's how that they've evolved, but um, maybe some extensification of some improved grassland, switching over to less intensive land use types, and they can provide um, us with these multiple benefits within um, within the floodplains. And uh, just like to acknowledge um, the, the different organizations that are involved with um, the Floodplain Meadow Partnership um, who are on our, on our steering group. So the RSPB, Center for Ecology and Hydrology, et cetera. Um, okay. And here are the contact details of myself and Emma, and then also, uh, the website of Floodplain Meadows and also the Twitter feed. So thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Claire. I'm Victoria Barlow and I'm going to lead the Q&A with Claire and Emma responding. Um, please do send your questions in. Um, I think we had, had two, but one was jumping ahead of, of the actual um, presentation. So I, I believe that that question's now been answered. So um, we have a question from Ingo Schuder um, and basically Ingo is asking, stopping short evaluation, what can we say to decision makers to motivate them to consider investing in floodplain meadows, its protection and um, or restoration? Gosh, that's a, <laughs> that's a very comprehensive one. Um, Okay. I've... Shall I? Can I say something here? Yes, you can. You could. Okay. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think uh, Claire's presented some evidence from some case studies, and there's in in the paper there are three different case studies um, w with differing amounts of detail. And obviously, the one on the um, floodplain meadow, we had quite a little go at trying to try, trying to do exactly that, which Claire has just presented. Um, but I think I think hopefully that gives us enough evidence to say that is as a concept, um, set, um, re rejoining rivers and floodplains is a good thing because we have, uh, I think Claire said, 42% of our rivers are separated from their floodplains currently by embankments and other um, structures, um, and therefore, and 70% of our land use is in is in is in um, intensive agriculture, and so therefore, there's a massive opportunity um, to start taking down some of those barriers and changing. Even even a small shift in the change of land use in a catchment, we think this argument says could deliver a huge range of benefits. So if you compare um, the intensive agriculture in a catchment and the number of benefits it delivers to the number of benefits delivered by the semi-natural habitats, then um, it's a massive increase. Um, and so even if we looked at a catchment as a whole and increased a small amount of our semi-natural habitat, we think we've got enough evidence now to say that that would give you a lot of um, benefits. Does that help? Claire, would you like to add anything or, or do you feel no, I, answered I, it I, adequately? I, 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 th I think it's it's really it's something that I've wrestled with, and I think it's something that a lot of people wrestle with. Is that is is when we say value or valuation, we immediately think of of monetary value um, because that's how our society is, is set up. But um, it was it was Ian Hodge really at the at the um, 
at the conference, um, the Valuing Nature conference, where he, his title was The Value of Nature and the Nature of Value. So it's just words mean thing, different things to different people. But I think it's just using valuation as, as evidence, really, um, that these ecosystems are, are, are really important. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Ingo. And um, we now have a question from Doug Whitfield. Um, in your diagram of ecosystem goods and services, there's just one land use type shown as not providing flood risk alleviation goods and services, fen, marsh and swamp. Can you explain why this type is different to the rest? Um, yes, I I can. Yes, there is, we haven't got one for, for floods. The reason for that is to do with capacity really um i suppose if you think of it as a as a, a reservoir is already 100 percent full of water then it it can't in terms of flood storage it, it there's very little capacity for it to, to to store more water so in terms of um I mean, this this was very broad brush, really. But in terms of fen, marsh, and swamp, if they're already very very wet, um, as in the the the, the water table uh, is at the surface and stuff, there's very little capacity for actually for it to store more water in terms of flood alleviation. Whereas um, other species-rich uh, environments, so species-rich floodplain meadows, where it, it because the water table um, is tends to be lower um, throughout the year, it does rise in the winter, but it's it, it's not. It can take that extra flood storage capacity in in those situations. I hope that I hope that um, makes sense. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Um, question here from Catherine Gutman Roberts. I noticed recreation was on one of the values, which I think has covered it covered vis visitors. I wondered if you could consider recreational angling value as many fish rely on off channel habitats during their life cycles. Um, I mean, we, we again, it, it, it's the it's the available uh, data available to be able to to con consider this. Um, so uh, Cricklade is one of those um, where we looked at uh, Cricklade. Uh, it's a national nature reserve. It, it, it contains about 80 percent, 90 percent of the uh, snake's head fertility population. So w we know how many uh, visitors um, go there in terms of to 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 view the uh fritillaries um i mean the angling uh i was going to say industry um uh, you know recreational angling is is huge in 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 um, the uk um so yes it, it it should be important but um we we were trying to look at um non-river um habitat really with within this um so yes i think it, it's it's something that should be considered but we we were kind of looking at the land use within uh within uh the floodplain rather than the the river per se okay thank you very much and um thank you to catherine i just want to clarify to people that we are taking questions for 15 minutes and i am generally going through um as they've come in but if your question's not asked um, you will get a response from the presenters at uh, as soon as we can get the questions to them and your contacts okay so Natasha Lombino from the Environment Agency would like to ask quantifying natural hazard regulation is a tricky thing to do but so important I'd be keen to know more about how the values were derived over to you ladies Emma, do you want to answer that one? Or shall I? Do you want it? to go first? Yeah, I'll have a go first. <laughs> um, the, the, the data that we do have, that there, there isn't that much uh, data available. Um, there was uh, stuff uh, done for the natural ecosystem assessment um, done by Joe Morris and um, who looked at the, the values of this. But he, um, he used the different Corin land use uh, types 
which we felt so basically they were uh pete um another uh another um amount so we didn't uh so inland marshes peatland bogs um so they were really equivalent to the fen marsh and swamp and he gave figures from uh flood control of up to about 608 pounds per hectare um but um it, so but there was an, an another study um looking by christy um who looked at the biodiversity action plan and he was uh looked at how the habitats uh contributed uh to uh, flood storage and other things. So the the numbers that we used in this to that um, Christy uh, was used in the Bebont uh, paper, and we also used the similar figures from that um, in quantifying um, uh, Cricklade. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Um. So thank you for that. So then I've got two questions that are coming up about landowners and floodplains. Um, one from Christopher Hawkins um, asking, do we believe specific management requirements where not otherwise specifically designated should be a statutory requirement to be more in line with market compensation? Um, and then another one that's about incentivization for landowners to change their land use or practices. And how easy is it? How is how easy have you found it to translate natural capital for floodplains to farm business models to secure funding, and therefore change? I don't know if you want to take each of those questions separately or whether you have a. Um, I can well I can have a go. At, I can have a go at the first one mm -hmm. um, to start off with, if that's okay. Um, it's Emma speaking. Um, I think this question is asking whether we think people should be made to manage floodplains in a particular way as opposed to it being an incentive based system like we currently have i think that's mm -hmm. what the question is um and that, well i mean that's a really tricky question to answer i expect everyone's got some experience of where um, agri-environment schemes have worked or haven't worked and um and we've just done a big survey looking at gra species rich grassland restoration projects in in floodplains, floodplain meadow restoration projects um, across the UK, and it's really patchy in terms of how they work and how they don't work. So obviously um, the incentive-based system is mixed in how well it works. I don't know how that's going to translate if the government go on to a pub public goods and services um, incentivization program, but I suspect it comes down to how much money is available to incentivize people. Um, I'm not a big fan of enforcing management on people and particularly when it's um, farmers who may have farmed in a particular way for a very long time and know their land better than anyone else. So I suppose I would have to plump for um, an incentivized system um, as we currently have, but perhaps one that's more um, targeted and uh, funded at the really key areas where we think benefits might be delivered most. Okay, great. Thank you. And so the follow on question, which was about um, how you have found it, how easy have you found it to translate natural capital for floodplains to farm business models to secure funding and therefore change? Does that, is that something you can answer? Um, I'm not sure we can answer that. Can we, Claire? No, I, I, was, I was just thinking about that in terms of, I mean, one thing that I'm really interested in is if you can in, incentivize landowners to extensify some of their um, improved uh, grassland, um, what benefits, the, the, you know, measuring those actual benefits in terms of increased carbon storage, um, but also, you know, whether they are still economical um, to, 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 uh, to do that switch is something that is probably un, un, unknown or yeah um, it's quite it's quite difficult it's it's always that chicken or the egg do you do you say that we need to do it from an environmental point of view and that the the benefits in terms of but I mean, these these meadows were part of the farming system, so they can still be farmed. It's just the the in terms of um, 
you know livestock units and stuff you you might not uh, be able to get as much uh, beef or milk or whatever uh, off that same area of land but they might be considered um, you know goods that because of the way that they've been farmed they have a premium in terms of you know um, so yeah this is something that I think the how you translate land use into farm businesses is something that it, it still needs to be l looked at um, I mean I, I yeah I mean I, I, I used to work at Reading where the agriculture department and how translating agri-environment schemes into the impact on farm businesses is you know it's something that we still really need to look at. Okay thank you very much and we have what time for one more question. Um, so this is a question from Kirsty Brannan. Um, given the evidence gaps you refer to what risks might you foresee in trying to base future land payments fully on natural capital stroke ecosystem services? That's you a to... very good question. <laughs> <laughs> Long gap there. <laughs> um, well, it's risky um, until we can say we've got all the evidence we need, um, which I don't think we have yet. Although, although we, this would be pertinent to point out um, that one of the other questions that's come in is a uh, a request that we let people know that there's an evidence base on natural flood management from the Environment Agency um, where they undertook an, a, quite an extensive uh, review of case studies across the country looking at um, what evidence there was for the benefits of natural flood management techniques um, which is available so that can be shared to anybody who doesn't already have that um, but even that has evidence gaps in it um, Sorry, Claire, you were going to say something as well, weren't you? Well, I, I suppose it's one of those things with that it's not necessarily the evidence gaps. It's do we have enough? It's kind of turning it on its head is do we have enough evidence to suggest that um, we can say that la land use in, you know, there needs to be land use change. Uh, so it, it's kind of turning turning the question on the head is that it's not what gaps we've got it's whether we have enough evidence to suggest that we should be changing things does does that yeah i hope that makes sense it's just kind of turning it on its head in that given uh you know climate change um and what's happening i mean uh, listening to what's happening in australia on the radio this morning um it in terms of Townsville being flooded um, you know it's thing things are unprecedented in terms of you know rainfall events and and so I, I yeah I would turn that on the head and say is do we do we have enough evidence to suggest that we need to be doing it rather than we need to have a uh, hundred percent evidence before we can proceed hmm. yeah yeah and, and I think that's I think that's that's probably as far as you're going to be able to get with a natural capital detailed um, evidence base because we're never going to know everything about it are we um, okay thank you so over to you Anita for um, final thanks okay just thank you so much to Claire and Emma for that that fabulous presentation and responding to those questions I think I think the point you left it on is exactly the, the crux of the issue we have now the natural capital approach is being taken forward we don't have a perfect evidence set. Do we have enough to be able to make sound decisions? Perhaps we will never have enough, but perhaps we have to have to go with what we have now. And I think that's that's the whole crux of the issue that we have with natural capital at the moment. So um, thank you so much to Victoria for organising the meetings and for so ably hosting that question session. Um, many thanks to all of you for attending and for those of you who sent in questions. I understand that Claire and Emma will get back to those who have submitted questions here that we haven't had time for today. Um, and Claire and Emma's contact details are up there, so please do feel free to contact them. And please do download the report from the Value in Nature website if you have, haven't done that already. OK, with that, I'd just like to close this webinar. Thank you so much, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.